So welcome everybody. What I'm doing today is doing a summary of a very big topic, which is fire safety in mass timber buildings. And um, it's a huge topic. I can't give you everything you need to know, but I can get I, we can get started and we'll see what we can do in the next 40 minutes. And I'll be very happy to answer questions. So you can see on this slide, the sponsors of the Timber Design Society. Um, there is also a, another sponsor for the work I've been doing on mass timber building fire safety, and that is Timber Unlimited, which some of you will know. It's a very new organization. It's a timber design center funded by the government through the Ministry of Primary Industries. And I'll talk a little more about that a little later on, but that's an important organization which is starting to create some waves in the mass or in the whole timber buildings area. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, what is mass timber? Well, I think that a lot of you know what we're talking about here, but in terms of materials, we're really talking about three different materials. We're talking about glue lam, glued laminated timber, which can be made any size and any shape. There's no limit to what you can do with glue lam, except getting it on a truck to take it to its final destination. It's used for beams and columns and sometimes for floors. Um, the next material which we see a lot of in New Zealand is LBL, laminated veneer lumber. And if you want to make pieces of wood which are long and straight and strong, this is ideal material. Um, beams, columns and floors. There are three LBL factories in New Zealand. So there's, there's plenty of material available and it's an excellent product. But the, the new material on the block is, sorry, is cross-laminated timber, CLT. And CLT is relatively recent. We've, we can make large flat panels, which is just fantastic for walls and floors and roofs of buildings. Now, this photograph here was taken in the XLAM factory when they were in Nelson. They subsequently moved to Australia where they still service New Zealand, but now we have a very large modern CLT factory in Rotorua operated by Red Stag. So the, the availability of these materials is growing all the time. Um, why is there so much interest in mass timber? Well, the driver now is this, and it's a global demand and it's driven by the climate crisis. And the more that the cri climate crisis expands the more demand there's going to be for low carbon buildings. And the only way to make a zero carbon building is to build it out of wood instead of steel or concrete. Timber is a local sustainable material. We've got lots of it. You can see huge volumes of logs being exported. And if we, if we could just build our processing facilities to keep 10% of those exports in the country, that would be enough wood to replace half of the steel and concrete used. It's a healthy material, an attractive material, it's lightweight, and it allows for rapid construction. So there are lots of reasons for using wood and most of you know about those. In terms of buildings, which mass timber buildings are we talking about here? I'm going to be talking about buildings like this, which are mass timber walls and floors, um, I'm going to be talking about frame buildings. This is Beatrice Tinsley building at the University of Canterbury. I'm going to be talking about buildings with concrete core walls and mass timber gravity structure. This is Brock Commons at the University of British Columbia. I'm going to be talking about structural steel buildings with CLT floors. I don't have a photo of that, but I'll, that's very important. I'll be talking about hybrid buildings with light timber walls and mass timber floors. This Mary Potter Apartments in Wellington. And it also applies to TCC floors, timber concrete composite floors, which 
you can see there in the NMIT building with concrete reinforcing being prepared on the top. And if you look up above, you can see the, the joists on the underside of that composite construction. So we're con this talk is concerned with fire safety in all of those buildings. So what are the fire safety concerns? Um, photograph there shows a fire in a mass timber building and you can see a huge amount of heat release, huge flames out the windows. And not only from the furniture that was in there, all the tables and chairs and with plastic, foam plastic, solid petrol, which is in most of our buildings and lots of paper. But in addition to that, the, the, the timber linings on the walls and ceiling. So the important point to note here is that the New Zealand Building Code was written for non-combustible building materials. When the code was written 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, nobody was talking about multi-story mass timber buildings, but they are now. And wood burns, and it's very difficult to stop it from burning. We can apply intermessent coatings to reduce the flame spread, but if you get a big fire like that one in the photograph, um, the wood in there will be burning regardless of intermessent coatings. And then the timber adds to the fire load or the fuel load. And it can, it, in some cases, it can more than double the fuel load from the furniture and furnishings, which means a shorter time to flash over and bigger flames out the windows, at, which is a danger of external fire spread to the neighboring property and fire spread up the building. And then, a couple of other things which aren't thought about very much, but there's a danger of charring continuing after the fire has gone out. And that's a big concern to firefighters. And something else which is really only becoming, um, it's been known for a long time, but it has been sort of ignored. And that is that the strength of wood starts to drop after about 30 degrees and by 100 degrees C, the strength of the wood is quite a lot less. It doesn't have to be charring to lose strength. And I'll talk some more about that a bit later on. Okay, so that's just a few words about fire safety in these buildings. You can see in the photos there, we've got buildings with exposed wood on all the walls and the ceiling. Some buildings will have it only on the walls or the ceiling, or maybe only the columns, or maybe the beams and columns. But what most of you will know is that the architect and the owner and the wood producer, they want to expose all the wood they can for, for, for good reason, because it is attractive and healthy to do so. On the other hand, the regulators who are afraid of fire getting out of control in these buildings, they want to hide all the wood. That's the dilemma. What do we do about it? Well, we need good fire engineering, and we need some guidance. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this talk. So a few other things that have to come in here. This word encapsulation is going to be used. I don't like the word very much, but, but everybody uses it. We could say protection, encapsulation or protection, which is Usually, gypsum plasterboard, it doesn't have to be, there are other materials, but if we have one layer of gypsum plasterboard around a timber column, for example, that gives some partial encapsulation, and it doesn't, see, partial encapsulation, will, what it will do is it will delay the start of charring, and the manufacturers of the boards can tell you how much time you've got before charring will start underneath that encapsulation. They can also tell you the likely the time of the possible fall off of the encapsulation, um, which I'm not gonna dwell on that now because I'm just gonna talk about this full encapsulation. If you have enough layers, or if you have thick enough layers, then you get full encapsulation, which means the fire burns, a fire like we saw in the previous slide, and that fire could burn 1,000 degrees for half an hour or more, 
and there will be no charring of any of the wood because it's been prevented by what we call full encapsulation. And there are standard tests for encapsulation. We don't have a standard test in New Zealand, but there are special tests in Canada, Australia, and Europe. But we can come back to that later. I'll be saying more about it. Um, the concerns about fire safety in timber buildings are really related to tall buildings. We're not worried about houses, single story buildings where everyone can get out, even if the building is damaged or it burns down. It doesn't matter for a small building. But when you have buildings which are eight or 10 or 20 stories tall, and there are people living up there or people sleeping up there, then there's some concern, understandably. What do we do about it? Well, the first thing we do is we put in a sprinkler system. And I'll just come to sprinklers in a minute, but sprinklers are the best thing we can do. We've got to allow for the safe movement of people. That's for people to get out if there's a fire alarm and for firefighters to get in. And we've, we'll have to provide some level of encapsulation depending on the fire engineers, the calculations and the requirements of the, of the authorities. And we have to design for fire resistance as we do with any building. And you all know that fire resistance, there are two components to it. It's fire resistance to prevent the spread of fire through walls and floors and barriers and fire spread into ducts. But we also have to provide structural capacity so there's no structural collapse. And the principles of that are exactly the same if in a steel or concrete or timber building. But there is an additional question I mentioned before, what happens after the fire goes out? Because when the fire goes out in a steel or concrete building and there's nothing left to burn, then the fire is out. But in a mass timber building with charring of wood, the flaming will stop, the temperatures will drop, but there's still a possibility of some charring and that is of some concern. So those are the buildings. Just. Another example of this I showed before, the Brock Commons building in Vancouver, which for a time was the tallest timber building in the world at 18 stories. You can see that building half built. It's got reinforced concrete shear cores for the stairs and lifts and all of the, and CLT floors on columns, very few beams, mostly just CLT supported, point supported on columns, but if you go there now, it doesn't look like that because that building has full encapsulation and all the wood is protected with three layers of gypsum board. So we've achieved the, our carbon objectives of, of locking up carbon in that building. And we've achieved the objective of using a, a sustainable renewable material, but we have not achieved the objective of, of seeing all the wood with for, for the attractive appearance and the, the healthy component of it. So that's what happened there. What are we doing in New Zealand? Uh, before I do that, let me say something about sprinklers. Sprinklers are fantastic. They are far and away the best way of providing fire safety in buildings. If the sprinklers work as planned, we have no flashover. We need zero fire resistance, but we cannot guarantee it. I wish we could. But sprinklers, the reliability of sprinklers, depending on how you measure it, is 80, 90, 95%. But they sometimes don't do the job they're intended to if there's not enough water in the pipes or too many heads go off at once or the system is down for maintenance or the big worry is earthquake where there's no water in the street. So. Even if we have sprinklers, we still have to design for a fully developed fire. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So the firefighters have concerns and fens are part of this discussion that we've been having. And you'll see some names later on. And the firefighters are concerned about going into a building to fight fires where there are combustible lining materials and rapid fire spread and the greater risk of external fire spread and the fact that more firefighting water may be required because of the larger fuel load and what they call the overhaul procedures, 
the overhaul procedure is what the firefighters do after the fire is out in terms of inspecting and the, the, these procedures become more onerous. They were also, of course, worried about possible delayed failure due to, due to smoldering. So we have these concerns and we have to take them into account because the, as you know, the, the building consent process in New Zealand um, not only do you have to get sign off by your building control authority, but in many cases, FENS have a responsibility to sign off the building as well. And so we have to satisfy them. And that's where I'm coming from. So in terms of an international comparison, um, that graph on the right is from the Build magazine a couple of years ago, and it shows the requirements for fire resistance in buildings of different heights. And there happens to be a big gap between New Zealand and many other countries. And this applies to all materials, not only wood. But look at that graph there. We've got across the top, New Zealand, USA, Australia. And you can see it's going from single story up to 20 stories. But if we looked, for example, at eight story, an eight story sprinkler building in New Zealand, the fire resistance requirement would be 30 minutes. Be normally 60 minutes of unsprinkled, 30 minutes of sprinkled. But the for the same building built in Australia, the requirement would be three times more. It would be 90 minutes. And if that was in the United States, it would be four times more. It would be two hours, 120 minutes fire resistance rating. So as I say, this this is of concern to the regulatory authorities, especially as we get taller. It's not a problem for low-rise buildings, but it is for tall buildings. Okay, how do we address these concerns? Well, I'm now going to talk about three documents, and this may be a little bit confusing, but the first document I'm going to talk about was a book, a book, a document published last year called the, the Global Design Guide, yeah, I don't know whether you can see it. It's not focusing on the on my screen. I've got a copy here. But that book was a global book. And this year, we have just published a mass timber guidance document, which is like a New Zealand, some New Zealand guidance to that. And that's going to be part of a commentary, which is coming later in the year or early next year, with, to address all of the issues I've been talking about. So just to quickly go through this, the Global Design Guide, it's, it's 250 pages, but it costs nothing. You can get a free online PDF. Um, and it's got 14 chapters in it. You can see them all here from fire safety to performance-based design to firefighting. And the authors of that book were from 12 countries and several from New Zealand, including me and Colleen Wade and Ed Claridge and co-authors of Tony Abu and Dennis Powell and Paul Horn. So that book is available. It's there. It's free. It's useful. But it's not totally useful because it has not been written specifically for New Zealand. It's an international guideline. So what we have been commissioned to do in New Zealand, the Timber Unlimited have commissioned some of us to write a New Zealand commentary to that. And that group has been established, a steering group and list of authors. But before we get going, we really wanted to know what the end product was going to be. And so there is a new document which is being released right now, which is called the Mass Timber Guidance Document. And I'm going to be talking about that for the rest of the talk. The, the authors of that, I'll just list them all here. You can see where they've come from. Just reading through that, Martin Feeney from Holmes and representing the Society of Fire Protection Engineers, Colleen Wade from the Fire Research Group, Ed Claridge from Auckland Council, Omar and Angela from FENS, Devin Glenny from MBIE, Dennis from PTL, Tony Abu from the University of Canterbury, Paul Horn from Becker, and Robert Finch from Timber Unlimited. So this document that is called the Mass Timber Guidance Document, that's what I'm going to talk about now. It's a draft document. It's only eight pages. 
and it's a guide to supplement the use of the fire the, the fire documents acceptable solution to and verification method to especially for multi-story mass timber buildings and the objective the reason for doing this is to remove uncertainty when mass timber buildings are being considered because right now if you put in a building consent application for a six-story mass timber building there's a lot of uncertainty because the council's unsure what to do and fans aren't sure what to do and and this really all of these people the owners the developers the architects the engineers the regulators and the timber industry need to know what is possible so we're trying to we've produced a document to reduce this confusion but very important bottom line this is not the building code that may come later this is just a guidance document and its status it really it has no status under MBIE, it is just a guidance document prepared by a working group representing some parts of the industry. What does it say? Well, it's based on a flow chart, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, and it talks about three methods, which are the three methods that all fire engineers use every day, the prescriptive design using CAS2, the verification method design using CVM2, or performance-based design if out of scope of this document. Just it's important to know the fire engineers will tell you this. If they can do the fire design using the acceptable solution, there it's it's not an easy job, but it's relatively easy and there are a lot of boxes to tick. If the building requires a verification method, that is going to take two or three times the time and two or three times the fee. So there's a lot of people are reluctant to use a verification method if they don't have to. And if it's a very special building, then you jump into a performance-based alternative design. Okay, let's look at this flow chart. So there's a flow chart here, which has been prepared by Angela at FENS with a, and for our group. And you can't read any words in this, so I'm gonna overlay the words. So I'm gonna drive through this. What we've got here is the fire engineering approach in the left side, we've got the building design in the center and we've got the design rules in the right. And it goes like this. If you have a mass timber building, there are three ways, three approaches. The first one is acceptable solution. The second is verification. And the third method is performance-based design. And it all depends on the building. So if we, up at the top, we've got the building. This is actually acceptable solution one. If you have a house, a simple standard house, and it's all made of wood, you can do what you like. I don't care if the house is made of wood or steel or hay bales. We're not making any additional requirements for the fact that it's made of wood. So that's that's the house. On the other hand, if you have what's called risk group WS, which is high risk, high storage occupancy, then you've got to drop down here and use an alternative solution because if you we can't cover that in our guidance document. But for all other buildings, it depends on the height of the building. So if you have a one or two story building with what we call the escape height, less than four meters, that's the height to the top floor, not the height to the roof, there's no change, business as usual. And if you have a tall building, more than, oh, sorry, sorry, jump. That's the that one. If you're in the range from four to 25 meters, that's like up to eight stories or so, then our guidance document applies. But if you're above 25 meters, then you flow back down to the alternative solution because it has to be looked at specially. So all of that is using the acceptable solution. Now, we also, under some cases, that where the acceptable solution doesn't apply, we've got to go to the verification method. And under the verification method, we've really got the same three things. If it's a low rise building, no change. If it's a tall building over 25 meters, you have an alternative solution. Or if it's in between, if it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories, you come back to our guidance document. So what's in this guidance document? You've all been waiting patiently. 
I'll tell you something about it. What's in the guidance document for prescriptive design is most of it is in a table that looks like this. Now, this there's too much to talk about in one blow on this, so I'm going to guide you through this table. But first of all, I'm going to talk about these encapsulation categories. You can see there we've got WU, W100, W0. What does all that mean? Well, this is what it means. So we've said in certain buildings, you can have unlimited exposed timber. We call that WU. And if you want to have most a large area of exposed timber, you're in the W200 category, where the area of exposed timber could be 200% of the floor area. In other words, all the floor and all the ceiling. That would be that category. Well, the next category is W100, which would be, say, all the ceiling, but not the floor, or a mixture in the walls. Or W0 is full encapsulation. So let's see how we going how we use these in that table. Um, before I do it, just in terms of charring, what does what does encapsulation mean? Well, it means no charring during the fire resistance period, or or no temperatures more than three hundred degrees. And if you look in the jib catalog, you'll see that they they have what they call a one way rating. If you have one layer of sixteen jib fire line, then there'll be no charring for thirty minutes. And if you have two layers of 13 fire line, there'll be no charring for 60 minutes. That's just an example of what's available out there. Okay, let's go back to this table. There it is there. I'm going to hide some of it and I'm going to open up again. What you can see here is that for one and two story buildings, business as usual, no change at all, unlimited area of wood and using the acceptable solution. And what that means for nearly every building is if the building has sprinklers, it's a 30 minute fire rating. If there are no sprinklers, it's 60 minutes. There's one or two exceptions to that because care facilities need 60 even with sprinklers. But for most buildings, those are the requirements. Okay, if we go, if we go taller now for an unsprinklered building, what we're saying is that that's 60 minutes for three and four story buildings, it stays at 60 minutes with a with an asterisk and the asterisk means that as long as the building has an interconnected alarm system then it stays at 60 minutes originally this was 90 minutes but a lot of designers came back and said what about a three-story walk-up apartment it's it's that's a huge penalty to make it 90 so we've left it at 60 and the area of wood can be 100% of the floor area. So you can expose a lot of wood, stick at 60 minutes and that's it. But if it's unsprinkled and you go over 10 meters, then you're, we're up to a 90 minute fire resistance and with no wood exposed. And higher than 18 meters, this is not recommended at all. And the reason for the 18 meters is basically that's, that's the height, it's related to the height of firefighting appliances. So tall, unsprinkled buildings, the taller you go, you're going to have to put in sprinklers at some point. If we have sprinklers, then you can see we've this the 60 minutes, 30 goes to 60, but it's 60, 60, 60, with the area of wood being unlimited for three and four story buildings, 200 percent for five and six and 100 percent for seven and eight so that's all fine you might ask for that middle range if you if you if this w u if you if you hide some of the wood then you, if you, then you, we can cut that back down to 30 minutes if you hide some of the wood so them's the rules they're not rules this is guidance for prescriptive design Okay, let's say we the building code says for your building it's not acceptable. Does the acceptable solution doesn't apply? You've got to go to the verification method, and if you do that, then you've got two options. You've got full encapsulation, or you can expose some wood. And if you if you do that, then there's no changes to very few changes, minor changes. But if you expose the wood, you've got to include that in the 
charring in the fuel load. And there are methods of doing that with these iterative calculations with what we call the Brandon method, which is all described in the Global Design Guide and all other wood must be encapsulated. And a few other additional recommendations. You can expose the wood in stairwells and lifts. You have to fire stop all gaps and joints. There's encapsulation required for evacuation zone boundaries. The, there's some concern about the adhesive for CLT, and we're recommending that when you get over 18 meters, you have to use a fire resistant adhesive, and you have to be a little careful about isolated walls and columns. And for all of these buildings, you have to, the building contractor has to have a management plan for fire safety during construction for obvious reasons. Okay, so that's covered the document. I just, now I want to say something about the structural fire resistance, because I know we've got structural engineers here. This is a photograph from Brands, a fire test of a hollow LVL box beam some years ago, which was cut open after the fire. And that's what we've, we've got. And this is well known that wood chars at a predictable rate charring and it causes a lot of loss of the cross section and for glue lamb and lvl we just go to this code it used to be a chapter in nzs 3603 but it's now in the joint standard as nzs 1720 part 4 which gives the charring rate for new zealand grown radiata pine of 0 0.65 millimeters a minute plus a zero strength layer of seven millimeters and after that, you can do your normal structural calculations with the reduced uh, loads for fires, for fires. CLT is a bit different because the short, simple way of designing CLT for fire resistance is to use the manufacturer's load span tables. They have tables for walls and floors for 30, 60, 90 minutes and additional tables if the if the CLT is protected. That's the way to go. It's to don't waste your time doing a cal charring calculations on CLT for lots of reasons. Okay, carry on with structural fire resistance. You do have to calculate the char depth. And if you're using acceptable solution, you just take the time from the acceptable solution, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, multiply by 0.65. If you're using the verification method, you use the equivalent time and multiply. Um, if you're using the Brandon method, which is calculating the burnout fire, then one of the outputs from that is the char depth. And that means that the fire engineer has to talk to the structural engineer and tell the structural engineer what the depth of charring will be. And if it's CLT, the structural engineer will have to talk to the CLT supplier to find out, because in this case, it won't just be 30 minutes or 60 minutes, it'll be a different depth of charring, which requires some conversations. And then of course, there's the whole question of connections, which I won't dwell on, except to say this is very important. And Paul Horn is writing this chapter in the, and there'll be guidance on that, which will come. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is the, which is a bit of a worry, it's the strength of wood versus temperature. And this is not covered in 1720 part four. If you look into the Eurocodes or, or my book on structural fire design, this is the, this is this bit scary. This is the reduction of the wood strength with elevated temperature. And we've got bending, shear and compression, but that red line shows the reduction in compressive strength with temperature. And what that is showing us here is that if the wood just gets up to 100 degrees, nowhere near 300, long before it starts to char, it only has a quarter of its compressive strength. This is how the furniture makers do steam bending of wood. They put wood into a steam bath, they heat it up to 100 degrees and they can bend it because it, you have compression yielding on the compression side. And so this is a bit of a worry because it does mean there's a possible failure after the fire has gone out. 
And just to give you another example of this, this here is a graph of fire temperatures in a test of a, of a timber column. And the fire went out, it was turned off, the furnace was turned off at 60 minutes and the temperatures dropped, but the temperatures inside the wood kept going up and up and up for the next hour, which is a worry. Now, the same thing happens in concrete and steel, especially in concrete, but in concrete, the temperature, the strength doesn't drop until you get to several hundred degrees. It doesn't start dropping at 100. So there's a problem here, and this is going to affect isolated columns in very tall buildings. I'm not going to say any more about it now, except to say that's one of the reasons why our guidance document stops at 25 meters. If you're over eight stories, you're going to have to dig into it a bit deeper, do an alternative design, and the, both the fire engineer and the structural engineer are going to have to talk to each other about that. So I'm nearly done. Consultation, Timber Unlimited, led by Robert Finch, I've been consulting with the timber industry and the BCAs and FENS and SFPE and CSOC and TDS, and your comments are most welcome. You can find this document on the Timber Unlimited website. If it's not there today, it'll be there next week. And in conclusion, mass timber buildings are coming, like it or not. Wood burns. This affects the fire load and the structural performance. Solutions are available. And this design guide will help, followed by a New Zealand commentary, and possibly in the future, some code changes, but not in a hurry. OK, I'm finished. Thank you very much. In terms of access, you can see there, there's the Timber Unlimited website and my email address if you want to talk to me. Daniel, you're on mute. Thank you, Andy. Um, thanks, Andy, for this um, very great and in-depth uh, talk about fire. Um, I just came back from the Woodworks Conference in, in Wellington last week. And in fact, fire was one of the major questions uh, which needs to be addressed moving forward uh, if you want to have more timber building. Sorry, I'm being told to move my camera. Um, so I have a few questions uh, coming in. Hopefully there's more coming. Um, there's one question uh, from Mike Newcomb. Um, does the burning of walls, ceilings, and floors contribute differently? to the fire load? And how would you account for that uh, in the W100 scenario? Yeah, hi, Mike. Um, I think what you're, you're asking is, is the ceiling, is the charring greater in the ceiling or in the walls? And if you, if, if you are, the tests that have been done in fire compartments, it, it's a little bit, uh, it's not the way I would think. Intuitively, you would think that the, the underside of the floor would be worse because of the temperature gradient. But in fact, the charring rate is worse in the walls and especially at the base of the walls. And it's all to do with radiation from, from different surfaces. But the difference is not that big. In other words, if we're doing calculations, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get bogged down in that. If, if we know that we have a certain depth of char, let's assume it's all the same. And that wood which has been charred is then going to contribute to the fire load. And the structural engineer is, can remove that wood from, the, from the, the structure. I hope that answers the question. Um, thank you, Andy. There's another uh, comment or question, but I still want to read it out to you. Um, so you mentioned that the document will, will not be part of the building code, but do you think it will, uh, will be best practice guidance and also requirement of the Health and Safety at Work Act? Uh, well, I, I, as far as the, the has no act, I, I just don't know. <clears throat> I, I have no idea. We don't. We we're trying to remove bureaucracy and make things simpler. And my expectation is that this guidance will be something which is referred to by the VCAs and, and, and FENS. And of course, it doesn't apply to every building. Every building's different and there will be, there will be exceptions. But uh, 
I think we're in, in a path of evolution here. The purpose of the document is to remove uncertainty and give guidance for simple buildings. And in, in due course, as this evolves and more research is done and more test results become available and, and new products and new adhesives become available, then this will all settle down. And at some point, there'll be some changes to the building code, but not in a hurry. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, so the questions are slowly coming in. Um, there's two questions from Cam. Uh, I read them both. Um, why doesn't New Zealand go direction of a higher fire ratings as per overseas standards? And the second question is, with full encapsulation, does the temperature of the timber increase? And if so, how do we deal with the loss of strength in these elevated temperatures? Okay, two very different questions there. <laughs> First of all, um, look, the, the fire resistance ratings in the New Zealand Building Code were developed 20, 30 years ago. And um, I was not part of that. But I think part of the problem was that some of the people on those code committees, they thought if they could somehow justify a very low fire rating, that would be beneficial to the industry, to the building industry, and reduce costs, which it does. And the problem, of course, is that we don't have fires as often as it rains. We know about the leaky building problem because it rains every week and we find out about it. But fires, big fires, are very rare events. And the problem we've got here is, is a very rare event which could have severe consequences. So things may change, but it requires a lot of consultation and a lot of feedback. And, and the, part of the problem is if you increase the fire ratings, then it suddenly means that all the people, all the existing buildings are then deemed to be unsafe. It's a bit like putting up the seismic requirements in Christchurch and Wellington. It, it creates a lot of problems. So that's that. The second question about encapsulation. If you have full encapsulation, the wood never gets hot. It doesn't even know there's a fire. And encapsulation, the, so it's just a balance. If you get some charring under the wood, the charring won't start until much later and the temperatures will be much lower. So encapsulation is a good thing, except that you can't see the wood. Okay, any more? What's next? Th thanks, Andy. Uh, that's a quick one here, and I, I think it's important to mention that. Um, has the Timber and Limited Guidance document, the one you spoke about, have been endorsed by the regulatory authorities? Uh Yes, well, there is uh, not in a formal way. And so in terms of the regular, let me just say this. Um, in terms of the BCAs, there has, Ed Claridge, who's the chief fire engineer at Auckland Council, has been part of this discussion from the beginning. And so it re represents the guidance that Auckland Council would give. And we're expecting that the other BCAs will, will follow suit, but there's been nothing formal there. In terms of, and the same thing applies to FENS, there, is, there will be a disclaimer in the document from, from Fire and Emergency New Zealand for good reason, just to say that although they support this guidance, they have to point out that it won't apply to every building and many buildings would have to be considered um, as a special case and and that's fair enough because this as i say the whole field is evolving um i have another tricky question um how confident is the industry that the 0 0.65 millimeters per minute charring rate is actually accurate and does it need more um investigation in new zealand okay Good question, and and I have not, I didn't mention that in the talk. There is anecdotal evidence that the 0.65 showering rate is too low. Some people have done fire tests where they've found, well, a lot of the LVL people have been using 0.72 for some time based on some tests, 
And there are people have reported to me of tests where the charring rate has been as up to one millimeter a minute. So, but right now, following our guidance and following the, the regulations, my guidance, my recommendation is stick with the 0 0.65, but that is going to be looked at independently in collaboration with, the, with Australia because the 0.65 comes from a joint New Zealand-Australian standard and I'm Timber Unlimited and I are in discussion with the Australians to do some tests, but I'd like to keep that out of the current debate just to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andy. Um, another question which came in, um, will these requirements need to be applied retros retrospectively to already constructed buildings? No, absolutely not. No, easy, easy we, answer, we thank we you. We can't go there. Okay, uh, another question, probably a bit more specific. Uh, why do we only need to consider the decay phase for freestanding columns and load-bearing walls and not beams, beams and slabs? Not sure how to satisfy the building code clause C63 for buildings requiring internal firefighting without considering beams and slabs as well. So maybe you have some thoughts on that, Andy. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is, I think that the, this is a question about structural robustness. What in some codes is called disproportionate collapse. Um, which we don't, if you look at a, the building code in, in, in Europe and in England, you'll see there's a lot of questions being asked about disproportionate collapse. It doesn't, those words don't appear in the New Zealand building code, largely because our buildings are very tough anyway, because they've designed for seismic design. But the, the point here is that this type of, this phenomenon of the temperatures heating up and a collapse later in the fire, it's not of concern for a small building because the, it, there'll be lots of firefighters and lots of water and there's nobody upstairs. So it's really a risk assessment and it's really what we're simply waving a flag and saying, if you have a tall or a very tall timber building, you need to consider the structural robustness and take into account the possibility of this sort of thing happening. And if it's like, you know, what's the most critical structural element that's likely to be an isolated column or an isolated wall acting as a column. And a floor is much less of a problem because when you have a floor, the compression side is usually cold and it's the tension side that's hot. But in a column, it's the it's the, the column is the building element where you've got compression across the whole cross section and it's that loss of compressive strength that's the big problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. And I understand there will be more guidance on this once the full document is being published later on. A um, few more questions I want, I want to go through. Um, so that's from the team at Becca here in Christchurch, uh, who thank you for your excellent presentation. And they're wondering how um, the encapsulation using fire-rated plaster will still results in elevated temperatures. So for example, the average temperature of 140 and, and peak at 180 degrees behind the plasterboard. Can you perhaps comment on how this, um, uh, this in respect to loss of strength at 100 degrees you have mentioned? Okay, let's, first of all, let's recognize that the, the building materials that are used in New Zealand, and I'm thinking here about light timber frame with, with jib on both sides, have, that material has been subjected to huge number of fire tests. And the same thing with CLT. CLT used in New Zealand has been, has been through 30 minute, 60 minute, 90 minute fire tests. And for that reason, those products which have been through been tested and certified 
let's let's not worry about the the hundred degree mark because that's been taken care of in the fire test. And as I say, I would only I think we should only be worrying about this if we have a a very unusual building, a very tall building, or a building some an out of the normal building. So I, I think I'm going to stop there because I re, I don't think we should lose sleep over this. Um, for the for most buildings we can rely explicitly on the fire resistance tests that have been done and they've been done well and we've got good fire fire labs that do proper tests and we can rely on that stuff so i think that's my answer thanks eddie um the last two questions and then we call it quit um would the guidance document consider the differing effect of heights in the fire cells and therefore the consequent effect on the fire development, temperature layers and so on, um, regarding the proposed exposed timber percentages you mentioned before, the W0 to 100 and 200? No, no, look, that's, we've got to, we've, we're trying to keep this thing as simple as possible. And so this, we've come up with some guidance rules for the run of the mill buildings. And, and there's no point in getting very explicit in one part of this design because we need to you know you've heard this expression before we need a consistent level of crudeness and there's a lot of uncertainty in this there's uncertainty about the the occupancy of the building and the amount of fuel in the building and the whether the windows will break or they won't break and whether the sprinklers will go off or not there's a huge amount of uncertainty and so we've got to come up with relatively crude rules that cover the general situation and so when you start talking about slightly different higher or lower fire cells if you're worried about it you have a look at it but i don't think we should be demanding that because it's the same time building owners and developers want to keep the the fire engineering fees under control there are lots of reasons for not no we don't want to dig any deeper than we have to thanks andy and, and a bit of a follow-up question to this um someone is asking how this w uh, 0 100 and 200 how have this um fire ratings or these requirements been determined can you give us a, a quick glimpse of how this has been done Look, the, the answer is simple. It's a committee decision. We have to go somewhere. W0 means everything's encapsulated. WU means unlimited area. And if we want some steps in between, well, we just picked a couple of steps which seem to be reasonable. There's, there's, no, there's no science behind it. Thank you. And very last question, probably a bit technical, but uh, because it came up at the Woodburg conference, I, I think it's relevant. Uh, the question is, uh, so in terms of the encapsulation methods, uh, will the guidance document consider the various phases of charring as done in the, uh, the recent testing done to EN standards, which have these different phases of charring? So time to char, slow charring during phase two, charring at failure of protection. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Okay, the short story here is that the guidance document is talking about all or nothing. In other words, if you have, if a certain area of wood needs to be protected, then you protect it, you give it full encapsulation, so there's no charring for the 30 or 60, 90 minutes fire resistance. Now, what I have been doing with others is looking into the possibility of using a thinner layer of gypsum board, in which case you would get charring after some time, which in other words, delaying the time of charring, but you still get some, but all we've said in our guidance document, if that happens, you have to look into it yourself. You're on your own, but find a way around it. Um, I've been talking to, Winston Warboards about this, and there's a possibility of developing some calculation tools for this, but that we're not there yet. So, if anybody wants is interested in this, we'll come and make some suggestions. Come and talk to us. But that's the short answer. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. Um, so this covers um, most questions. And uh, since it's after one, I think we, we stop here today. So again, Andy, thank you very much for your time, <coughs> excuse me, presenting today and also your time in working with the wider working group on this document. And obviously big thanks to Timber Unlimited to facilitate this very important topic um, and this discussion between uh, specifiers, the, the, the wider industry and the consenting authorities and fans. Um, thanks to all the attendees, thanks Namir and, and Nicola for hosting and organizing. And I see you at the next uh, webinar later in October. Thanks, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you.